Hello, I'm Dexter. Today, I'd like to welcome Dr. Hurt from Dr. Harry Hurt's Head Protection Research Laboratory in Paramount, California. Thank you, Dexter. Our laboratory's mission is simple and straightforward. It is to prevent deaths and debilitating injuries. HPRL has been in existence for more than 10 years. It is a continuation of the scientific laboratory at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, which operated for more than 20 years. Today we will be talking about motorcycle helmet standards and why they should affect your decision on your next helmet purchase. Dr. Hart established HPRL when he retired from the university. He is perhaps best known for the landmark use. See Accident Investigation Study published in 1981 and commonly referred to as, the Hurt Report. Interestingly, in the years since its release, the report's conclusions have been verified by well-documented studies in the European Union as well as Thailand. That is correct. Dr. Hurt has been in the business of studying safety issues and conducting accident investigation in helmet testing for more than 50 years. It was almost immediately apparent to me that this long experience has given Dr. Hurt the vision to distill a lifetime of research into a few practical lessons. For example, over the past 50 years or so there has been a lot of record-keeping and documentation, enough to cloud a galaxy. Through the arduous process we call the scientific method, certain facts have become undeniably apparent. However, you might question their validity because many special interest groups have attempted to use the data by taking it out of context and distorting it to suit their own political agenda. In the end, it is all very confusing. So let's concentrate on something we can easily relate to. First, let's start with the basic elements of a helmet. A motorcycle helmet has two major parts, the outer shell and the energy absorbing inner liner. The inner lining is made of expanded polystyrene or EPS, the same stuff used in beer coolers, foam coffee cups, and packing material. Outer shells come in two basic flavors, a resin fiber composite, such as fiber glass, carbon fiber and Kevlar, or a molded thermoplastic such as ABS or polycarbonate, the same basic stuff used in face shields and F-16 canopies. The shell is there for a number of reasons. First, it's supposed to protect against pointy things trying to penetrate the EPS, though that almost never happens in a real accident. Second, the shell protects against abrasion, which is a good thing when you're sliding into the kick and update an Third, it gives graphic designers a nice, smooth surface to paint on. Riders and helmet marketers pay a lot of attention to the outer shell and its material. But the part of the helmet that absorbs most of the energy in a crash is actually the inner liner. When a helmet hits the road or a curb the outer shell stops instantly. Inside, your head keeps going until it collides with the liner. When this happens, the liner's job is to bring the head to a gentle stop. If you want your brain to keep working like it does now, that is. The great thing about EPS is that as it crushes, it absorbs lots of energy at a predictable rate. It doesn't store energy and rebound like a spring, which would be a bad thing because your head would bounce back up, shaking your brain not just once, but twice. EPS actually absorbs the kinetic energy of your moving head, creating a very small amount of heat as the foam collapses. Very neat. Indeed. Tell us about your studies. Absolutely. One important study we conducted showed that for every rider wearing a helmet that has died of actual head injuries, 45 riders who were not wearing helmets died of head injuries. I don't mind admitting that I was shocked by that fact. If I do not wear my helmet, I am 45 times more likely to die of head injuries if I have an accident. But what accurately describes a head injury, anyway? Here again, there is a foggy misconception of what this means. The term head suggests an injury to the outside of the skull. But in fact, the term more accurately refers to an injury to the brain. This brings up another ugly subject. Something called debilitating injuries. Is that correct? Yes. These consist of anything from a temporary loss of mental capacity to the total annihilation of brain function. 
It is difficult to say exactly how many riders who've had near-death crashes end up as living vegetables because in this case, the record-keeping offers conflicting results. One thing is for certain. It is a fact of life that many riders who end up on life support were not wearing helmets at all. And, that they may not have had those debilitating injuries if they had worn a proper certified helmet. Everyone has their own version of a living hell. Mine is to be alive, but not living. What we call brain dead. I understand that there is a fundamental debate raging in the motorcycle helmet industry. In the fiberglass reinforced, expanded polystyrene nutshell, it is a debate about how strong and how stiff a helmet should be to provide the best possible protection. Why the debate?